the terrifying tale of the Rolling Stones' long-forgotten founder Brian Jones, which includes drugs, jealousy, and Nazi costumes. Being a Catholic, I was very inhibited, admits Don Malloy, the mother of Brian Jones's fifth child. I think he kind of forced me to admit that I shouldn't be ashamed of my appearance or my abilities. He was sexy as hell. True enough. His sensual touch was irresistible. I felt so good about him. He gave me a nice and loving feeling. He was a fantastic teacher of sensual intimacy. The Rolling Stones' life story is best told through the women who loved him and whom he briefly loved, according to Nick Broomfield's biography of the band, whose drug and alcohol ravaged 27 year old body was recovered from his swimming pool on July 3, 1969. Jones didn't seem to gather any moss after his strict parents drove the long haired, jazz loving, wastrel out of the Cheltenham home. He came up with a strategy whereby he would woo a woman, move in with her and her parents, get the former pregnant, and then jog out, leaving behind broken hearts and fatherless kids. In the early 1960s, Broomfield calculates that Jones performed this five times. The comedown is remembered by Linda Lawrence, who he met when he was 20 and she was 15. She claims, we were the love generation. Many years after he abandoned her and their kid, Julian, she showed up at his house asking for a small amount of cash from the well-known Rolling Stone to see her through. Inside, Jones was in the early stages of his affair with his new girlfriend, actress, and 1960s at girl Anita Pollenberg. Anita and Jones both laughed at Linda rather than offering her money or allowing her to enter the house. According to Jones's friend Prince Stash Klosowski de Rolla, whose unusual name, with its two apparent drug references, seems oddly fitting his dark side, came out when he started hanging with her Anita. In a picture from that era, Brian and Anita are seen with matching hairstyles and haggard attractiveness. He is dressed like a classic Prince Harry, complete with a Nazi outfit and swastika armband. It appears that the picture captures the darker side of the swinging 60s its harshness, self-importance, and naive politics more so than its emancipation. Jones was already becoming less and less famous by that summer of 1967. Undoubtedly, the Stones' unique sound sprang from his love and appropriation of African-American blues music. He reworked the songs of Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson, and Howlin' Wolf to give them an edge that, for example, the Beatles could never match. These scrawny, White London Herberts were exposing the blues to many Americans for the first time when they toured the U.S. and made appearances on TV shows with Helen Wolf. At the very least, Jones deserves praise for that. With the exception of sporadic musical epiphanies, Bill Wyman reminds us that Jones was the inspiration behind Ruby Tuesday's flute. Jones devolved into a liability who could hardly perform live. Jagger remembers that he didn't look shocked when he was let go from the band a few weeks prior to his passing.